indeed is a professor of English and a specialist in Jewish American culture and literature. He's the author of several books, which I'll tell you about, and so many uh, articles and uh, scholarly uh, articles. They go from the 17th century in America to the present. The ones that I think you may be familiar with are and, and on the table here, for sale. Uh, New Israel, New England, Jews and Puritans in Early America. Not many of us know about that. It tells the story of the Sephardic merchants who traded in Boston and Newport between the mid-17th century and the era of the American Revolution, a very nice specific target and really an interesting time. How Strange It Seems, which I just mentioned, which is the cultural life of Jews in small town New England, which explores how contemporary Jews today live outside the larger urban centers in the Northeast and have been able to acclimate themselves to local practices while not relinquishing their strong sense of Jewish identity. I think we probably have a lot of people here who have been in this situation. I know that I have. Uh, and so today, we are going to be introduced to Michael's latest book. It's from Rutgers University Press, 100 Acres of America. And in this work, Michael combines literary history and geography to restore the Jewish American writers to their role as critical members of the American literary landscape from ready for this, the 1850s to the present, not just the 1930s, go all the way back. So this new work has been described by author Rachel Rubenstein as generally exciting, path-breaking, and a breathtaking historical, geographical, and cultural uh, writing. Hoberman brilliantly revises our notions of how quintessentially American landscapes shaped American Jewish writing. Elegantly written and cogently argued, this study unsettles, get this, unsettles the stories we think we know about Jewish immigration and territorial belonging in America. Now, at the end of the presentation, we do have some of his books, not all, but they are available for sale. We've also just made our first sale. And uh, with that, may we begin? Are we ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much for everyone to come. I'm so glad to see you my friend and mentor, Jules Chemetsky, who many years ago when I was a clueless graduate student, not understanding anything about anything, um, I got to study with Jules. And uh, he got me going on the road to uh, being, I guess, some kind of a scholar of American literature. Um, also, I wanted to mention uh, another person who's here, my friend Ken Schoen, who, along with a few other people, uh, a few years ago started something that some of you may know of called the Jewish Historical Society of Western Massachusetts that has been putting in a good effort to curate, collect, uh, and publicize the culture of uh, Jewish people in this part of Massachusetts, uh, going back also to about the 1850s, I think, if you, go, if you look at the Springfield story. So uh, anyway, thanks uh, and all, for all of you for being here. Uh, I want to start out by showing you the cover of the book, and I'll tell you just a little bit about it now, but I'll tell you a little bit more about the cover and why it's depicting what it's depicting. Um, this is a lithograph. Uh, what you see is a lithograph from the 1850s. Uh, it's someplace in the United States. It's a real place. Maybe you can guess where it is. If you think you know, uh, you can check yourself when I tell you later on where it actually is. So just to keep you going on that. And maybe you're wondering why that lithograph why that image. But where I'm actually starting the talk, although I hopefully I know how to move through these slides. Let me, let's see. Oh yeah, here we go. We're starting here because uh, I thought if I'm going to be giving talks about Jewish American literature, I should start where people are on firm ground. <laughs> and the firm ground for Jewish American literature, in my opinion, consists of two uh, excerpts. This is one of them. Emma Lazarus's poem that's at the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. 
you're familiar with this. If you're not, uh, well, you, I don't know where you've been the last 140 <laughs> years. But uh, in any case, um, what strikes me about the poem, many things, among other things, the fact that it is about America, it invokes the idea of America. Of course, many of us have associations between its ideology and our idea of America as a refuge, as a place to come to. Uh, and it's, again, something that people are familiar with. If you haven't read any other Jewish American literature, you've seen that. Even non-Jews have heard of this poem. Um, the other piece of uh, firm ground, perhaps, for people would be this, which is the opening sentence of Saul Bellow's Adventures of Augie March from 1953. And I'm not going to say very much about it, but again, it, if nothing else, the very first sentence of the book invokes America. Right? I'm an American, invokes the city of Chicago, uh, tells you that the speaker has been shaped and influenced by being from America. And so these are interesting things to me as somebody who's trying to study Jewish American literature. But one thing I will also point out about them is that neither one of them really says anything about America as a place. Uh, it, they both invoke America as a concept. And uh, what I wanted to do in my book was to talk about how Jewish writers not just engage the ideological concepts that we associate with America, but actually uh, talk about America as a place, as a physical space, as a, as a geographical space. Uh, where I would start in terms of uh, literary works that I talk about in my book, I'll mention another literary work that, again, if you have some... Uh, familiarity with Jewish American writers of, of a more recent vintage, uh, a, ra a writer that you know, Philip Roth, uh, published a book in 1997 called American Pastoral. This is the Philip Roth book that if people only know, well, they, everybody, of course, everyone knows Portnoy, but um, uh, if you go beyond Portnoy or, or if you never somehow avoided ever hearing about it, this would be the other book that you would, this would be the book you'd encounter in college, for instance, in a course on contemporary American novel. And this to me seems like another, another focal point, reference point, uh, in so far as the title itself is hinting at an idea of America as a place, America as a pastoral environment. It's a problematic concept, which I'll get to soon. But first of all, I want to know, uh, I, I know I'm a professor, but I'm not testing you or anything. I just want to know, uh, how many, how, are people familiar with this novel? Have you read this novel? Yes. yes. Okay. One reason I'm asking is because I don't want to give too much away if you haven't read the novel and you want to have it be a, you know, the sort of thrilling experience that it should be, then I'm going to avoid telling you too much. So I, I have the sense that maybe some people don't want me to give it away. So I won't give it away. I won't give too much of it away. But I'll say just a little bit that the subject of this novel is, uh, the protagonist of the novel is a, uh, a guy named the Swede Lvov. And he's called a Swede because he's got blonde hair and blue eyes. He's Jewish. He's growing up in the Newark, uh, Jewish neighborhood in Newark that Roth grew up in in the 1930s. And not only does he have the blue eyes and the blonde hair, but he's also a, uh, an athletic powerhouse. And everybody worships him, uh, including all the females in, in the high school. And the narrator of the novel, Nathan Zuckerman, has always been enthralled with him, too. The Swede is a little bit older than Nathan Zuckerman is, and so Nathan has grown up just always being enthralled with this guy for everything he had, everything he represented. And what he represented to these Jews in Newark was the idea that a Jewish, the son of a Jewish immigrant, uh, I guess, uh, or the grandson of a Jewish immigrant could make it in America, could become one with America, which is the, where the pastoralism comes in. Because among other things, the Swede, uh, you know, he sort of cruises to success. He takes over his father's glove factory in Newark, making a lot of money. And at an early point in his life, when he's in his teens, he's traveling on the, 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 uh, the team, the baseball team is traveling through some rural part of New Jersey, and he sees a house at the side of the road, and I'm sure that's not the house. It's a novel, of course. Uh, I think the house that he saw, actually we know the house that he saw is a stone house. And this is not a stone house. But this is the best I could do. The internet was not showing me stone houses in central New Jersey that day. Uh, what this is is an 18th century, very small 18th century farmhouse. 
in and around Morristown, New Jersey. And this, what the Swede wants is to own, he decides at age 16, I'm going to own that house someday, and I'm going to bring my girl there, whoever she, he doesn't even know who that's going to be, but he's going to meet some wonderful young woman, and they're going to buy that house and live there forever and become one with the land, hence the idea of the pastoralism. Um, now, the problem with that is that uh, it doesn't go his way. It goes his way for quite a period of time, and then things go wrong, and that's the part that I won't tell you, except that they go really wrong in a very cataclysmic, disturbing, politically, uh, sociologically, something that really gets to the heart, not just of what, what's wrong with the Swede and what's wrong with American Jews, but what's wrong with America and maybe what's wrong with human beings in general. All of that stuff blows up in his face, sort of like what happens to Job. So the dream of this house is an elusive dream, particularly from the standpoint of Jews, who I don't have to tell you have a long history of having fraught relationships to places and never knowing exactly are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, sorry. <laughs> don't mind, I don't want to ignore. Something. No, no, it's fine, um, ignore. Never knowing exactly where they fit, where, where, how long they can stay there safely, how much prosperity they can pursue, when they're going to, uh, when they're going to, in doing so, relinquish their sense of Jewish identity. So all these things are made to be, be very problematic by Roth's novel. And... Uh, what I wanted to do in my book is to look at not just Roth's work, but other Jewish writers from going back, as Dorothy said, from the mid-19th century to the present day to look at how these Jewish writers have engaged with this sense of the idea of the sense of place and how at times they have participated in some of the dominant idioms that we find in other, uh, let's say, classic works of American literature, where American places, different types of American places, are associated with certain ideas and certain ideals, uh, and to what extent they go against those trends, to what, against they, to what extent they might participate in them and then resign from them at some point. How does it all go? How, how have Jewish writers tapped into American ideologies of place? And somewhere along the line when I was formulating the book proposal that uh, Rutgers ended up accepting eventually, uh, I, you know, like a lot of other people, I didn't really know what I was doing, and I was just coming up with ideas and, you know, throwing things around. I'm fortunate enough that I am part of a small, uh, it's an online writing group. I know the, I mean, I do know the people personally in it, but these are, it's a, uh, about three other scholars who do early Jewish American history. Uh, one of whom uh, teaches at Reed College, another is in uh, Washington University in St. Louis. So I shared this thing that I was trying to put together that I didn't understand well with that group, and my friend Laura Liebman, uh, who teaches at Reed College, said, oh, I know what you're doing. You're doing, you're going to redo Jewish American literary history. I said, oh, thank you. And so from that point on, when Laura said that, he said, oh, yes, that is exactly what I'm doing. That's when I was able to figure out how to structure the book, how to set it up, how to, uh, how to do it, and, and really what its purpose was. So uh, not to say that I have redone Jewish American literary history. I've done a version of Jewish American his literary history that focuses, again, on sense of place and geography. In order to do that, I had to be true to my starting point, which is physical space. How do you organize a book that is purporting to talk about the sense of place? How do you organize it in such a way to be faithful to your stated intention of writing about places? And so as I thought through my sense of American literary history and American geography, I decided to organize the book into chapters that would correspond to different types of landscapes. And so I'm going to speak a little bit about some of those landscapes, not all of them, uh, and some of the highlights that uh, connect to those. So in some way or another, people might, it seems like a, a fairly ordinary precept to suggest, well, America starts on the frontier. There have been many historians that have said America is, begins on the frontier, is a frontier, or was a frontier nation, at least for a certain period of time. So the first chapter of the book looks at Jewish writers and their relationship to the American frontier. 
and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, in that case, we're talking about the, the texts that go back to the 1850s. Uh, I also, of course, how can you talk about Jews in American literature without talking about cities? So there's a chapter about cities, uh, and I'll talk more about that as well. Uh, there's a chapter about small town Jews, uh, particularly during, and each, I should say, each of these chapters is focused on a landscape in connection with a particular historical period. So the frontier chapter is about the 1850s, roughly. The small town Jews chapter, what I look at is Jews in small town America from roughly the 1890s to the 1930s, which uh, according to a few social historians is sort of, that's, that's the peak of small town Jewish life in America. Suburbia, which is where Philip Roth comes in, suburbia, exurbia, uh, and then, uh, well, I'll get to the final two chapters in a little while. Those are different. Uh, they're looking at American ideas of geography, but not actually American spaces. So I want to go now and tell you a little bit about the frontier and that story. That, to me, is that's sort of the most attractive, in a way, that's the most uh, exotic, attractive story uh, for me. To tell, it's also the most uplifting one. By the time I get to the end of this talk, it's not uplifting anymore. I was telling you. Please enjoy this part because when I get to the uh, when I get to the the current era, no longer uplifting. Um, one of the tasks, of course, is to try to delineate how these Jewish writers are, as I said, participating in, but also pushing against dominant trends. And so the dominant trend. Uh, I don't know where I picked this up. Maybe it was in a seminar I had with Jules or probably earlier uh, literature we were reading where uh, the dominant trend for frontier literature in America, let's say the literature of the first half of the 19th century, is very much uh, dominated by single individual heroes. Natty Bumpo and uh, James Fenimore Cooper comes to mind. Uh, actual people, Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone. This is the, uh, front, the idea of the frontier is a single man conquering the wilderness, uh, not spending a lot of time socializing with people, but instead looking at the wilderness as this sort of cultural vacuum over which he, and it's a man of course, over which he is going to assert dominance. And the next figure I'm going to tell you about uh, doesn't quite do that. Uh, he tries and fails and then tells you about how he fails to do this. So I'm going to dip now into the story of this individual. Uh, by the way, if, if you find this story to be an interesting one, there's a fantastic film that I would recommend to you, which has been, uh, I think it was doing the rounds of the Jewish uh, film festivals maybe three or four years ago. It's called Solomon, uh, Carvalho's Journey, and this man is Solomon Nunez Carvalho. So this film is worth seeing, uh, and, uh, and you'll learn a lot from it. In any case, I want to tell his story, and then I'm going to read a little bit from the book uh, in which I focus on, on a particular episode in his story. So Carvalho was born in Charleston, South Carolina, in the early part of the 19th century. And at that time in Charleston, uh, as you may know, this is an important factoid for people to know, from 1800 to 1830, Charleston was the center of Jewish life in the United States. More Jews there than in New York. That's for several reasons. The main reason seems to have been that Charleston was much closer to the Caribbean than New York or Philadelphia was. And the, act, the, the most active point of, of Jewish cultural activity in the early part of the 19th century really was in the Caribbean and northern South America. So, uh, you know, we think of being United States-centric, we think of New York and Philadelphia and Boston as the centers of Jewish life, but the center of Jewish life until quite late in this period really is much farther south, south of Charleston in the Caribbean. He's born in Charleston. His father came there uh, towards the end of the 18th century and uh, very closely affiliated with the Jewish congregation there, which is this, their synagogue is the second oldest synagogue in the United States. Um, he grows up uh, in the synagogue, in fact, so close to the synagogue that when that synagogue, this is the one in Charleston, when that synagogue burnt down, uh, the only reason we know what the interior of that synagogue looked like is that Carvalho painted it from memory. Mm. Painted it from memory. So, I've skipped ahead here. He became a, he went into, uh, he became a painter. He trained uh, with Thomas Sully, who was a, a 
uh, well-known American painter in Philadelphia. And uh, he painted quite successfully. He, there's some wonderful paintings by Carvalho that are in various museums in the United States. But sometime around the eight, late 1830s, he discovered, among other things, that it's hard to make a living as a painter, even as a portrait painter, because there are just fewer and fewer rich people who can afford to commission a portrait of themselves. Uh, and fortunately, at the exact same time, this is when daguerreotype came out. And so Carvalho went into photography, and he became a very successful photographer. He had studios in three or four cities, including Baltimore and Richmond and New York. And that is how he came to the attention of one of the great heroes of the frontier, the non-Jewish heroes of the frontier, somebody you also may possibly have heard about who was named John C. Fremont. Uh, if you didn't hear that name of his, you might have heard him called the Pathfinder. So he was the first, he ended up with several points of, of prominence for him. He was the first governor of California. He also was the first Republican candidate for president. He lost uh, the election in 1856. He was a free soiler, he was an abolitionist, interestingly also from Charleston, but that's another story. In any case, in the mid-1850s, Fremont wanted to jump on board, no pun intended really, the, the effort to uh, map out a transcontinental railroad. And there were several parties who were trying to do this at the same time, and uh, Fremont decided, you know, he's done, I think he had, by that time, he had done four expeditions across the Rocky Mountains. <coughs> What's a fifth expedition? That's no big deal. So he gathered money together to uh, make this possible. And one of the things that made this expedition more complicated was that in order to, to, in order to adequately and accurately map out a transcontinental railroad, you had to be able to cross the Rockies in the wintertime. So this was no ordinary episode. Uh, he's getting ready to do it. Fremont being the very sort of scientific, rationalistic, and also politically ambitious person that he was, thought, well, I better document this. And in order to document it, I'm going to hire a photographer. I'm going to hire a daguerreotypist. And so that's where Carvalho comes in. Carvalho was recruited to be part of this expedition. At this time, when Carvalho received notice from Fremont that he had been asked to do this, of course, immediately he said, yes, I want to do it. He had never sat on a horse. <laughs> he had never done anything like wilderness travel, let alone in the wintertime. He was from Charleston, uh, and he was a he was a city boy. But uh, he, who could say no to to this offer? So the story is a, an interesting one. What happens with the expedition? Uh, just briefly, they make it from Kansas to Utah. And then, uh, and people are dropping like flies. They're, they're, at one point, they lost, uh, I think, something like 300 mules went over a cliff, I mean, which was their food supply. So it was, a, it, in many ways, it was a disaster. And Carvalho barely survived it. He actually stopped in Utah, uh, recuperated for a period of time, and then traveled the rest of the way to Los Angeles after he got better. He actually ended up in that capacity being one of the founders of the, the first synagogue in Los Angeles. But th that, too, is another story. What I want to talk about is his writing. So remember, I mentioned these photographs, right? He's hired to take photographs. This is the only photograph we have. This is the only photograph we have. He brought an enormous apparatus, glass plates. I mean, you know, to make daguerreotypes in any situation, let alone in the wilderness, was you know, an incredibly complicated task. And so there were, there were, you know, entire, an entire wagon train was devoted to carrying his equipment over these precipitous passes and so on. The glass plates survived all that. They survived long enough so that that uh, lithograph on the cover of my book is adapted from one of the photographs. What happened to the photographs, though, is that Fremont didn't, Fremont was a control freak and didn't want to let anyone have access to them. And they were all housed in a warehouse in New York City, and the warehouse burned down in the 1880s, yeah. and this is the only photograph that we have. Oh. Oh. There are about a dozen or so images that were adapted into lithographs, like the cover of my book, which I'll get to in a little while. Um, fortunately, Carvalho wrote about his experiences. Otherwise, we would know nothing at all about this story. And, uh, and even that was a task because Fremont, 
was such a control freak that he forbade any member of the party to write a journal. And the way that Carvalho ended up writing his book, the book is called Incidents of Travel and Adventure in, uh, in the Far West. It was published in 1857. He wrote that book very uh, resourcefully by sending long letters to his wife in Baltimore. <laughs> and then when the expedition was over, he put the letters together as basically separate chapters in a narrative that tells the story of his travels. Uh, I want to read a little part of my book uh, to describe one of the episodes. And I described this episode in particular because it gets at what makes Carvalho a different writer. Remember I was talking about these frontier, these heroes of the frontier and their vision of the West. And I think that Carvalho's description of his own exploits in the West is much different, uh, is, is, is a different take on that whole idea of, of conquering. So this is uh, in an, an earlier episode, before they get to the mountains, they're still in Kansas, they're on the Kansas prairies, and something very exciting happens, which is that, uh, I forgot to mention that they're accompanied by a, a party of 100 Delaware Indian scouts. This is a massive, a massive expedition. And the Delawares in particular are very excited because they see that there's a herd of buffalo crossing the prairie, and it's an opportunity to go buffalo hunting. And so I'm going to tell that story mm -hmm. in just a second. So, first of all, again, I'm going to speak a little bit here about Carvalho's, uh, the way he writes. Uh, I have some commentary up, up on that, and his, the, the, the difficulty he had in trying to capture this experience. He faced the challenge of writing about the Far West by crafting a humble and candid account of the time he spent there. Extended descriptions of many bouts with illness and hunger that he experienced along the way occupied a significant portion of his narrative. He was ill most of the time, and he talks about it. He describes how uh, ill-equipped he was. While he described the most stirring geographical features he experienced with considerable enthusiasm, he made no triumphant claims for himself on the basis of having survived them. For him, the vastness of the West did not reflect the purported greatness of men who conquered it. Um, it stipulated a humbling experience and a deeper appreciation of the pleasures of contact and communion with other humans. At a later point, remember I mentioned he's recuperating in Utah, a highlight of, of that experience is he's in Utah, he makes it to Salt Lake City, he spent six weeks in Salt Lake City uh, with the Mormons. Salt Lake City had only been built ten years earlier, and he spends a lot of time describing the infrastructure that the Mormons have created in the city. He's very impressed by what a beautiful city the Mormons have built. He's a little perturbed about their marriage practices, but not perturbed enough that he didn't accept the opportunity to dance with Brigham Young's wives, the governor's ball. So he, he's very celebratory about uh, when he encounters any form of civilization, whether it's the Delaware Indians, of whom he was very fond, or whether it's the Mormons. Also, you know, these are two marginalized people in that time period, and he appreciates, nonetheless, he appreciates the opportunity to interact with them. He is not eager to assert his dominance over the wilderness. That's not why he's out there. <clears throat> not the least of its influences upon human endeavors, that is, of the West, was its evident indifference to their truth claims. Because the dominant tendency in the literature of the frontier was exaggeration, both of the landscapes in Normandy and of the courageousness of the men who traveled through it, writers like Carvalho, who wished to believe, be believed and wanted their words to be perceived as thoughtful, as, as opposed to merely entertaining, faced a difficult task. He could not but have been aware of the reputation that Western explorers had acquired for hyperbole. His description of somebody called Peg Leg Smith, whom he met somewhere between Salt Lake and Los Angeles, as, quote, a weather-beaten old chap who tells some improbable tales, was a case in point. So Carvalho knew that this was the trend. So there he is. He's on the Kansas prairie. And... Uh, he hears about the buffalo uh, passing through the area. He had been a reluctant hunter, he having no intention of joining the hunt until one of the Indians in the group, so when that we heard about the, the herd of buffalo, he was not getting on his horse to go after them. He was going to stay in camp. Uh, but one of the Indians said to him, quote, what for you no hunt buffalo? 
Whether he had been shamed into going along or was genuinely eager to do so, he prepared quickly for the hunt and within three hours of departing camp found himself chasing, quote, at least 6,000 buffaloes across the wide expanse of open country. His narrative account of the hunt conveyed the thrill he experienced upon encountering the grazing, playfully gambling, and slumbering herd, quote, on their verdant carpet. He's also a little bit of a romantic, you know, in the sense of uh, raising the... the, the, the the physical beauty of the landscape. He's influenced by uh, the same things that other writers of the mid-19th century are influenced by. He described the sight of the buffaloes as, quote, a sight well worth traveling a thousand miles to see. Later on, in the heat of the chase, he became entirely separated from the rest of the party, but pressed on to fire his rifle at a male buffalo's, quote, unquote, vital part. Uh, I don't, actually, I think the vital part is not what, <laughs> why that person just chuckled. Uh, but all the same, um, uh, the, the animal looked at him. Uh, and he says that he described the animal's dying look as having haunted him with a sense of having, quote, uselessly shot him down. So immediately upon killing the buffalo, he's regretful of having done so. With no compass to consult, remember, he's by himself now on the prairie. Uh, he summited a small hill to get his bearings. After an hour or so of riding in the direction of the hills from which he and the rest of the party had come that morning, he was fortunate to cross the path of one of the Indians who was out searching for his tomahawk pipe. Uh, the two made their way to camp, where the once kosher Charleston Jew was appointed the task of carving the liver out of a buffalo cow. No, he wasn't going to do that. Uh, then he gets back into camp. Uh, when Carvalho recounted his killing of the, of the bull, Captain Wolf, this is the nickname that they've given to the chief of the Delaware scouts, Captain Wolf um, looked at him, quote, with a most quizzical and incredulous smile and emphatically remarked, Carvalho no kill buffalo. No amount of insistence was sufficient to convince Wolf or any of the other Indians in the party that Carvalho had slain the buffalo. The Delaware's logic in reaching such a conclusion was incontrovertible. As Wolf had put it to the daguerreotypes, da, da, daguerreotypist, quote, when Captain Wolf killed buffalo, he cut out the tongue. Indians shoot buffalo, bring home tongue. Carvalho no bring buffalo tongue, he no kill buffalo. In the broader scheme of things, the author of seems to have understood well enough that not knowing the proper protocols and practices of buffalo hunting has been his downfall. Not able to distinguish a cow from a bull, right? He, I, I forget if I mentioned he had shot a bull. You're not supposed to shoot the bulls. They don't have as much meat on them as the cows do. So he had shot the wrong animal, uselessly, <laughs> failing to maintain an awareness of where the rest of the party had gone, being drawn into a useless and recklessly heroic chase after a lone buffalo, and not knowing that one needed substantial and communally corroborative proof not mere words about one's hunting accomplishments in order to be believed were detrimental to his case. It is a testament to the unusual degree of self-reflexivity and humility that we find in incidents, that's the name of the book, that its writer offered such a candid view of his shortcomings, especially on the subject of his credibility. By telling the story about his having failed to remove the buffalo's tongue, he owned that he might as well have cut his own. So this is essentially my con my contention about Carvalho, and um, I'm not going to talk about the other writer of this same period that um, I'll just mention uh, the other writer I talked about is somebody named Israel Joseph Benjamin, who was not American. He was actually born in Hungary, a, a, a Jewish visitor to North America who traveled also in the far west just before the Civil War. So I look at his account and Carvalho's accounts and try to uh, describe how they're exilic. Uh, and, and Jewish perspective changes and shapes the way they write about a place that American, let's say, more mainstream American writers would have treated differently. Uh, this was uh, that photograph there, and then that's the, the image on the cover of the book is this place. It's in Utah, actually. Um, they're called the Pinnacles. And if you watch that movie about Carvalho, uh, one reason it's worth seeing that film is that uh, they wanted to be able to recreate the glass plate images, uh, and they discovered a guy who actually does this. So there's an artist who uh, would, happens to be a fan of Carvalho. He taught himself how to make glass plate photographs. He had a van, and he drove all through the West, and he takes glass plate photographs of the same place as Carvalho 
when, and in that film you see them. It's the one way we have of seeing what Carvalho saw the way he saw it. Uh, I'm going to move now and talk about uh, uh, another episode in the book. So I mentioned, of course, Frontier. That's maybe counterintuitive for Jewish history and Jewish literature. The city, well, that's the intuitive part, right? We assume that if we're talking about Jews, we must talk about cities. And uh, the challenge I faced there was that every other person who's written about Jewish American literature talks about that. Uh, and there's a canon of writers that you can talk about if you want to talk about them, uh, including Abraham Kahan, uh, Henry Roth, and so on. There's so many writers, so, so many writers who have described that immigrant experience. I knew I couldn't do that because that had been done before, and I also didn't think I would have anything con to contribute there. So uh, instead, I, I sort of stumbled upon, uh, a, I'll say, a basically superficially non-literary body of texts that I ended up writing about. And I want to tell you a little bit about these books and why I thought they were important. So first let me show you this. So you've probably seen these Jacob Rees images. Uh, now this image does go back to that American realism class I took with you, Jules. Um, so we're looking at the turn of the 20th century. We're looking at the period of time when the largest influx of Jewish and other immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe come to North America between the 1880s and the 1920s. This period of literary history in, in the United States coincided with several trends, but one trend that I remember learning about and sort of in my own way being inspired by was a trend we call the local color movement. These were mostly New England writers and Upland South writers. Many of uh, the writers are female, Sarah or Orn Jewett from Maine. These were writers who had, they put it this way, they see pictures like this and they think, I don't want to go there, but I still want to write about America from the perspective of the local color movement, America doesn't exist in a city anymore. There is a city is, is not an American space. American space for these writers is Vermont or Minnesota or someplace like that, some rural space. And uh, so this is the historical period we're looking at. The books that I got into coincide with this period. In every major American city, particularly on the eastern seaboard, right before these uh, unwashed Eastern European uh, masses arrived, there was a Jewish population. The Jewish population in North America, as you know, perhaps goes back to the 17th century. There were smaller and maybe somewhat larger in some cities, pockets mostly of either Sephardic, but primarily German-speaking Jews who had been coming since the colonial era. There was a massive influx of German Jews arriving in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, and so this population of Jewish people is fully assimilated. They speak English, they write English, they're second, third, fourth, sixth generation. Carvalho's family is one of those families, of course. And at the time that they are experiencing this massive influx of their fellow Jews coming from you know, places in, in the, the far east of Europe, they feel a certain amount of defensiveness and they feel like they have to answer for their Jewishness and assert their American identity. And one way that they did it was that in each of these major cities, they would publish books. The best of these books, when I say best, I, I mean this kind of best. The best of these books is something called The Jews of Philadelphia. It was published in 1892, I think, uh, by Henry Markins. And these books, uh, these books essentially took the Jewish story of that city and turned it into a point of inspiration for both to convince Gentiles, see, Jews have been here all along, and also, I think, to convince these unwashed masses, wait a minute, you need to know what it means to be an American. We're Jews, but we've been here a while, and we want you to know what our history is. Now, the reason these books are, were interesting to me was in part because of that, I mentioned that sort of defensiveness, but also because, in a sense, they are rebutting, if the claim on the part of the, the, uh, the dominant trend um, among American writers is that the real America has moved to Vermont, this is a Jewish claim that's saying, well, actually, if you look at American history, American history starts in the city. And the proof of that is you don't need go far, no farther than look at the beginning of the American Revolution. Where did that happen? In Boston, in cities. 
What precipitated these conflicts? Mob violence, for instance. These were all urban movements, not, and not only that, but they were militated in the first place by economic needs that were driven by a market economy. So I'm not sure if these Jewish writers that I'm looking at were really deliberately thinking about it this way, but inadvertently or on purpose, their books push against the idea that urban America is not the real America, and they instead assert that America starts with cities and that Jews have been in cities going back to the 17th century. So uh, you have books that describe the, uh, the Jewish history in Lower Manhattan. This is a, an inverted, this is the Battery, right? That's Wall Street on the right-hand side. This is Dutch New York, or New Amsterdam. And of course, Jews were there going back to the 1650s. So these historians at the turn of the 20th century are rediscovering this episode in Jewish history. Uh, the books I, I mentioned, I, I'm, you know, there, I have a certain amount of skepticism about their historical validity. The books are very rhetorical. This very same thing, in fact, the very same thing that maybe um, disqualifies them as reliable historical sources suggests literary uh, capacity because they're very rhetorical, they're very florid, they're very ideological, ideologically driven. To give you an, an example, in the Jews of Philadelphia, first chapter, where do you think the first, the first chapter in the Jews of Philadelphia, where could that start? You'd think it might start, you know, Chestnut Street or some ship crossing the land. No. The first chapter of the Jews of Philadelphia starts in Ur with Abraham. <laughs> gets you to Sinai. Gets you to the Roman Empire. Gets you to Spain. Gets you to the Inquisition. And then gets you to Chestnut Street. So, all in one chapter. So that's, that's, that's the approach that these books take. Again, as historical sources, I've talked about these books at some Jewish uh, studies conferences and some of the scholars that, you know, you can't take those books seriously. Don't worry, I'm not taking them seriously as historical sources. I'm taking them seriously as literary gestures, right? And as literary gestures, they're really doing something quite unique, which is, again, they're pushing against that notion that urban America is not the real America. They have proof to suggest that it really is the real America. Uh, just a couple more images. Oh, did we run out here? Oh, here we go. Yeah, another image of uh, New Amsterdam. This, this is the landscape that these books are trying to uh, recreate. For their, and they're very focused on landscape, right? So in a book that's describing uh, the Jews in New Amsterdam, you will hear street names, and it'll say, you know, so-and-so had his cooper shop on such-and-such such a lane. And this, of course, is the same lower Manhattan where the unwashed masses are building their ghettos, right? It's the same exact landscape. So the landscape focus, of course, is important. Uh, this is a picture I took just a few months ago. This is Chatham Square, right near City Hall in Manhattan. Yeah. It's the oldest Jewish cemetery in the United States. Goes back, the oldest stones, I think, go back to the 1670s or 1680s. And um, you can't get in there. I was peering over a fence. But this is, these are the landscapes that these books reclaim as Jewish territory and also, again, as uh, their assertion of, of that, you know, this is where America starts. Now, I told you that things were going to go downhill. And they do sort of go downhill. I want to tell you just a little bit about how they go downhill, and, um, not, but not dwell on it too much. After I talk about the urban story, I tell a, a, one final uplifting story, which is that of, of uh, some two Jewish American writers who are writing in the pre-World War II uh, era about small town life. One writer you've never heard of named Jacob Leeser, who was a reform rabbi, grew up in upstate New York. He wrote a juvenile novel about um, this family that lives uh, in a made-up town in upstate New York, and what a wonderful, uh, beautiful life they had. Their father owns a store. This is right after the Civil War. And they just live this wonderful existence, and everybody treats them very nice. The father arrived. This, I thought, was an interesting coincidence. The father arrived with his peddler's sack on July 4th, 1863, which is the day after the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, 
So almost as if to say, okay, now the Jews are here. Now that the Union has won the war, here come the Jews, and uh, and uh, and here comes our little uh, little injection of cosmopolitanism. The other writer I talk about there is Edna Ferber, the best-selling novelist, uh, who grew up in Appleton, Wisconsin, and also has a glowing. Uh, she wrote also an autobiography and a, and a novel about growing up in Appleton. Almost like paradise. She describes Appleton as paradise, particularly for Jewish families like her. But then, as I say, things go downhill, and the, the downhill trajectory, uh, I may get in trouble for this. I think when I gave this talk last week at Amherst, uh, at the JCA, of course, I had a much smaller audience there, so who cares about them? But I got some weird, I got some weird looks. I got some weird looks about this because my contention is that basically after World War II, when Jews achieve economic and social success, the tie to the land falls away. The aspirational quality of this literature I've been talking about drops away, and what you have instead is a kind of a despair and anomie and alienation, which manifests in the Philip Roth novel, where the guy who th he thinks he can own America, it doesn't go that way for him. Um, the, uh, I, I've already spoken about that, but I'll just mention, I told you there, there are two final chapters in the book that talk about something else, and I want to just briefly mention those and uh, show you a couple more slides, and then we'll do questions. So um, I ran out of landscapes, right? If you do the frontier, you do urban America, small towns, and um, uh, the suburbs, what's left? Well, what's left for Jewish writers, particularly after World War II, are two places outside America, but we're still talking about Jewish American writers who are influenced and shaped by their experiences of the American landscape. And these two landscapes are the landscape of the shtetl. Uh, if you're familiar, the most famous uh, book, uh, well-known book in this case is Jonathan Safran Foer's Everything is Illuminated, right? So we're talking now, I've, I've accelerated now, we're, we're into the 1990s here. Uh, that's one of these landscapes. And my contention is that, and I think this is why I was getting the weird looks, uh, is that uh, th after World War II, when Jews, to put it bluntly, when Jews become white people in America, uh, and they're no longer kept out, that aspirational aspect that made them want to assert some connection to the landscape is gone. The suburbs don't offer any inspiration. And if you want to dig into Jewish earth, you have to go to the shtetl, right? But of course there is no shtetl, and that's part of the problem. So when Saffron Foro goes there, and uh, when Rebecca Goldstein, the other novelist I talk about in that chapter, uh, her book Mazel, when they go to recapture this shtetl, what they're recapturing is a memory of a place that by definition is, was and is going to be eliminated. So even when they're writing about, like in Saffron Foro's novel, he's writing about events, you know, the founding of the shtetl in the 1790s and so on, you can't read any sentence in that chapter without knowing what's going to happen in 1942. So that place is doomed. That place is not Jewish space, right? It's a Jewish fantasy that is not a viable one. In that case, the other factor that I was considering was that at the same time that you have these two shtetl novels, and there, there are other Jewish writers, you know, contemporary Jewish writers who, who sort of do this sort of reinvented shtetl, that is happening at the same exact time that you have writers like Toni Morrison, uh, and there's a whole Native American uh, literary tradition that's coming into its own in the 1970s and 80s. Now, African American writers, Native American writers, have a claim to American soil, and their claim to American soil is a complex one, but it has partly to do with the fact that they have, they struggled and survived through incredible oppression on American soil, and that is a, that's a memory that doesn't go away. The Jews don't have a story like that about America, right? The best we have is, you know, my grandfather was on Hester Street, and then my, and then they moved to Queens, and then they moved to, uh, you know, Morristown. So in the absence of that kind of, in the absence of a, of a Toni Morrison who can go back to the South and look at generations upon generations of African American rootedness in the soil, the Jewish writers that I talk about in that chapter go to a made-up shtetl. 
Uh, and that's why I say it's not an uplifting, it's a, it's, they're, they're great books. I don't mean to say they're not, I don't denigrate the books. But from the standpoint of Jewish writers being inspired by space, really the only space that they're inspired by is American suburbia. That's what they know, and that's what they bring to them in their attempted reinventions of the shtetl. The last chapter of the book, you can't talk about Jews and physical space if you don't talk about Israel, right? And so there are two uh, contemporary Jewish, uh, Amer Jewish American, again, that's the focus, right? Jewish American uh, fiction writers who uh, publish, in one case, uh, a, a, a novel, and in another case, I'm looking at a collection of short stories that take place on these two, I don't know that these writers know each other or correspond or anything like that, but they both coined the phrase, the Wild West Bank. And uh, in both cases, you have uh, Jewish, Jewish American protagonists, products of American suburbia, products of you know, elite educations in the United States, disaffected youth whose parents send them to Israel in one case, or in another case, uh, some sort of fairly successful middle class families from Baltimore who decide that they're, Baltimore isn't Jewish enough for them, so they have to go to uh, the West Bank of the Jordan River, and they join settler life, and in both cases, in different points in the narratives, the speakers refer to the Wild West Bank. Why that's significant to me is that they're essentially transposing an American mentality to the land of Israel. And in one case, in one tragic instance, the guy who is living out there on the Wild West Bank, herding sheep, trying to avoid IDF patrols that tell him he can't herd his sheep in that part of the area. He thinks it's because there's Arabs around. It turns out, no, it's that there's a, uh, a bomb testing site. And the IDF soldier doesn't want him to get blown up by a mine. But he uh, asserts his right. This is Jewish land, and I'm a Jew, and I can go wherever I want with my sheep. Uh, later on in the same story, this same protagonist ends up uh, shooting uh, like a nine-year-old Palestinian boy who is throwing rocks at his car, killing him. So there are tragic consequences to this Wild West mentality being transposed to the land of Israel. So, you know, that's, that's the, the downward trajectory that I mentioned. And it, it was an irony that I hadn't really anticipated when I started writing the book. I, I mean, I didn't really think it through that in the episodes in the book where Jews are outsiders, that they will be participants and, uh, and very enthusiastically embracing the idea of their connection to American space. By the end of the book, geography is just a problem that can't be solved. And the only solution that these writers have is, again, transposing what they know from America, which is the movies and suburbia, to a, a world that, uh, who that does Who are the writers? Um, you had to ask. Oh, Jonathan yeah. Papernick and Risa Miller. Yeah. I was worried somebody was going to ask Ken, and I was going to, I'm going to blank on their names, but I remember. Um, so, but, to end on a slightly uplifting note, I give you Kinky Friedman. Um, I, I, I don't want to end on that, the, on that sour note. So, uh, recently, Kinky Friedman published, uh, he's writing a memoir, I think, or maybe it was already published. If you don't know Kinky Friedman, he's uh, Kinky Friedman and the Texas Jew Boys, the one, the great <laughs> Jewish star of country music, uh, uh, native Texan. Uh, in a memoir, he describes that one of his gigs somewhere in West Texas, somebody gave him, he didn't even know who it was, somebody handed him a menorah made out of an armadillo. <laughs> and um, I just, I thought that what he said here, I want to recapture this and, and read this and, and just leave us with this thought. Uh, he, he says, we, he's driving across West Texas with the menorah next to him in the passenger seat. So that's who we is. We learned that there was a great deal of common ground between us. We were both bastard children of twin cultures. I was a Jew, perhaps hideously misplaced in the heart of Texas. The, the menorah, quite similar in nature, was also misplaced in this world. Some would no doubt relate to him only as a menorah, armadillos not being known to them. Others would recognize him immediately as an armadillo, but they would be totally unfamiliar with the menorah aspect of his being. They wouldn't know a menorah if they stepped on one, as they undoubtedly have, etc., etc. So there's something about this armadillo menorah, so there, this imp the impossibility of it, that appealed to me as, this is, I don't talk about this in the book, but when I've been giving the talks, I've, I've ended it here because, Again, it's the, the, there's something 
uh, both intuitive and actually totally impossible about American uh, Jews in American space. Um, and this somewhat captures it. There is one last uh, sort of uh, pleasant picture to look at. Um, at the end of the book, uh, there's a concluding chapter uh, where, uh, and that's, you can see there's a little figure there in a madras shirt. That's me and my wife Janice took that picture. This is the oldest Jewish house in North America. This is the Gomez Mill House in uh, Newburgh, New York. Or it's on the outskirts of Newburgh, New York. And uh, Janice and I were driving a couple years ago. We were on our way somewhere else. And I happened to see a sign saying that the mill house was there. And I knew all about it, but I'd never been there. I never really pictured it on a map. So we went and stopped and took a walk around the grounds. The house, you couldn't get in the house. It was closed. It's a museum, but it was closed at that time. But, uh, you know, at the end of the book, I, I try to have sort of a meditative moment about thinking about the idea of the oldest Jewish house in North America and how that both is and isn't significant, right? It's, it's significant in the sense of wanting to, you know, be able to put, put your finger on a map and say this is Jewish space, but it's also totally insignificant in the sense that it's ephemeral, right? Like, well, so much of this is uh, the house itself. You can see there's a stone, uh, stone foundation, the first floor. That part goes back to the 17, about 1715. The brick part was added, I think, uh, sometime around the American Revolution. And Daniel Gomez, the, whose house it was, was a fur trader who uh, started his uh, fur trading in New York, in New York City. Uh, but then, uh, if you were a fur trader in the early part of the 18th century, you had much better access to furs if you were in the Hudson Valley, further north. And so he moved his family to outside Newburgh, and that's how this house got to be there. I think the family stayed until about the time of the American Revolution. And uh, so, anyway. Uh, oh, and I should mention that under, you see the little the stone bridge there, the creek, I'm not sure if it's that creek or there's another creek uh, a little bit farther off the, the out of the frame of the image, uh, if you look at a, an old map, that creek is called Jews Creek. And it has been called Jews Creek since uh, Gomez was there in the wow. mid-18th century. So, thank you, and I, I hope this time for questions. I can't thank you enough. My thought about questions is, is this is a little bit after 12, and I know some of us... Um, probably may have scheduled things for uh, after 12. So if it's okay, if we can do maybe informal questions. Sure. and yeah, people I'm not going leave, anywhere. Um, you, can, uh, you can take off just a couple of things to keep in mind. There are books for sale here, um, and uh, this is a rare opportunity to buy a book and have it signed by Michael. The other is, um, please come back next week to CBI Cafe. For the second hour, we're having uh, Larry Fine, talking uh, emeritus professor from Mount Holyoke College in Jewish Studies, talking about the first printing of the Zohar, uh, the great foundation of uh, Jewish mysticism from the 13th century Spain, how it came to be printed, and the story of its printing. So come back next week for that. Thank you, Michael. Please stay around for questions, buy some books, and uh, look forward to seeing you again.